Okay, good evening, everybody. I want to introduce myself. I'm Wally Young. I'm a member of the Southwest Michigan Postcard Club. And uh, I'm here to talk this evening to you about the historic covered bridges and grist mills in Michigan. They're, uh, I call them relics of the past because many of these buildings don't exist anymore. Uh, some of them have been repurposed into businesses and uh, some of them are still standing as their original use was intended to be a grist mill. So we'll go through uh, about 45 slides tonight. We'll start with the covered bridges and then we'll, uh, we'll move into the grist mill. Uh, just a little bit about why I collect covered bridges and grist mills. Uh, I, I love covered bridges. I think they're beautiful structures. And uh, grist mills also kind of fit into that category. In fact, out east, there's some really wonderful cars that have both a grist mill and a covered bridge in it, and it's just wonderful. But unfortunately, we don't have that in Michigan. But I, I just decided to collect them because it's something that uh, we see less and less of today. So. We'll uh, move to the presentation, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask, and uh, so we'll begin. Okay, so we're going to begin with the covered bridges. Um, the first bridge I chose to show you is the White's Covered Bridge. It is north of Lowell. It was north of Lowell. Um, it happens to be one of my two favorite covered bridges. It's, it was a, just a beautiful, picturesque covered bridge. Uh, built in 1867 and stood for the longest period of time crossing the um, um, Thornapple, no not, the Flat River. Yeah. Uh, a companion bridge about five miles downstream would be the Fallsburg Bridge. We'll talk about that one in a minute. Um, I love Whites. My son and I used to go fishing off Whites Bridge and we used to uh, go fishing off Fallsburg as a matter of fact. Uh, this is a picture of White's Bridge, approximately 1960. Uh, this bridge survived a lot. Um, about 10 years ago, somebody drove their car through the, what would be the left side of the bridge that you're looking at and fell into the river. Unfortunately, they did survive, but they were charged with uh, drunken driving, among other things. This is the uh, Sandy Shoal at the bottom. You can see the bridge over the years has had a lot of wear. Um, from time to time there would be money available and they would restore the sideboards on it. Covered bridges were covered because they were made out of wood and wood rots under natural circumstances. Uh, when you got into the cities, uh, a lot of bridges were made out of steel. Uh, in rural areas, they didn't have the money or the uh, construction companies to build those, so they built them out of what they had, and they had lots of timber. The uh, roofs were built over there to protect the timbers, uh, the floorboards, and the, the siding of the covered bridge. So it had nothing to do with uh, giving lovers a place to kiss as they uh, crossed in their carriages, although they do have that reputation as kissing bridges. Fallsburg Bridge, I think, in my estimation, is the prettiest covered bridge in Michigan. It's in a county park. Like I said, it's, it is north of Lowell. It's about five miles downstream. And it's just a very scenic area. Um, this bridge was built a few years after. I believe the same builders built both Fallsburg and White's Bridge. You go through the covered bridge and up the hill, there's a little settlement called Fallsburg. I recently found a uh, nice real photo postcard of uh, the village of Fallsburg. Uh, those are the kind of things you always look for when you're out collecting to try and find other pieces of history that fit with your collection. This is a picture I took probably uh, four years ago of Fallsburg in the fall. Um, it's a very popular park, lots of people fish there, lots of people swim there, and uh, it's a well-used covered bridge and a well-maintained covered bridge. Uh, after the White's Bridge burned about three years ago, it was more than a couple months later, some yokel with a loaded cement truck decided to drive across it, and there was quite a bit of damage associated with that. Unfortunately, the, it wasn't major and the bridge is still standing today. Another bridge in the area is the Thornapple River Bridge uh, in Ada. Um, Tom Wilson 
Uh, one of the members that's here tonight from the Grand Rapids Club says he thinks the house he lived in is that one that's peeking up right at, above the middle of the covered bridge. This was another bridge that they were all built about that same period, uh, 1867 to 1872. Uh, uh, this bridge was also torched by arsonists about 15 years ago. It has since been rebuilt. It's another view of the, the bridge, looking at it as you would see it going uh, through it. Another bridge I've never seen a real photo of, and I didn't even know this existed, is Bisbee's Bridge in Lowell. I have no idea where this was, but I assume it's near the city. It sits fairly low to the water, and as you get into the, the town of Lowell, the uh, Flat River is dammed up where there's a, a large green uh, mill operation. And I'm assuming it was somewhere near there, but I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure when I do this program in Grand Rapids, there will be somebody who will tell me exactly where it was. You think that was on the Grand or the Flat? Uh, it you know, it's, it, whoops, let's go back. It's pretty narrow to be the Grand. The old Leonard Street Bridge was a landmark in Grand Rapids for years and years and years. It's a very long bridge. Those of you who know where the Leonard Street Crossing is now will have an idea. It's several hundred feet long. Uh, this particular bridge, uh, as you can see, has six supports. This is a much better view of it. And this stood for quite a long time. Um, I think it was dismantled. I don't think it was... Uh, or did it get taken out because of a flood? Or a log jam. Or a lot, maybe a log jam. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to do some more research. I'm, I'm a postcard collector, not a historian, so uh, a lot of times when I'm talking to groups, I am talking to historians, and it's, it's interesting because they know a lot more about this subject than I do. Um, a bridge that was built not too far from Kalamazoo was the Mottville Covered Bridge. Uh, this bridge was located in the little village of Mottville, which is kind of between uh, Sturgis and, it's west of Sturgis, okay, let's just say. And this was the old Chicago Road. Uh, Chicago Road eventually became old US 112, and then when US 12 up here that went through Kalamazoo to uh, Benton Harbor was decommissioned because of I-94, the designation now is US-12. So that would be the old road that went through uh, uh, Niles and then went to uh, Sturgis, went through Coldwater. That, that road went through the Irish Hills then and ended up in Ypsilanti. Um, so this was a major crossing for quite a long time. This is a nice shot of the interior. A lot of the covered bridges, because they were shorter, had um, cross beams to support it. This one was made out of uh, two, two big arches. You can see that this is a little bit later. Automobiles were crossing it. It was replaced by the longest triple humped concrete bridge in Michigan. And for a while it was the longest one in America. Uh, this has been s since torn down. No, I'm sorry, the bridge is still there, but there's a new bridge that's built to bypass this bridge. So if you went down to Mottville today, you'd see this bridge. Another one south of here would be in Centerville. This is the Langley Covered Bridge. Uh, crosses the St. Joe River. And this one is kind of unique because it sits very low to the water, uh, just uh, four or five feet above the river itself. This bridge still stands today, and, it, and it's a uh, it's a crossing, a vehicle crossing, so you can drive your car through. It's quite a long bridge, same, uh, same as some of the others we've seen. Uh, some others that have been uh, built, this one in, in Middleville. Uh, I have to give credit, this is not from my collection. I have a, a friend, um, his name is Todd Clark. He lives down near Cincinnati, Ohio, and he's probably the biggest covered bridge collector in the world. And he, when I told him I was doing this, he said, well, I got, probably got some you don't. And I said, I'm sure you do. So Todd scanned some of these in, and so I have no idea about the history of this particular bridge other than it was in Middleville. 
just south of Grand Rapids. Uh, another one, and we have a little history on this, uh, a bridge uh, in Midland, probably crossed the Titabawasi River, and it tells us that it was wrecked by a flood January 20th, 1907. It's probably the company that made the postcard. This is one that Todd didn't have, and I, I, have, I can't find any history on it, but it is an extremely long covered bridge in Deerfield, which is down near Adrian, so I'm assuming this is crossing the River Raisin somewhere down there. But this is just, it goes on forever, but I can't find any information about it. So it's just one of those, he says, if you ever want to sell this card, you'll buy it. So. We're going to switch to mills now, and I'm going to start with probably my favorite mill that doesn't exist anymore, but the uh, dam does. This is um, the old grist mill in Springville, which is down in the Irish Hills. If you know where the old Twin Towers were in the Irish Hills, there's a road that goes straight south at Springville Highway, and that's in the background there. That road crosses over an earthen dam. There's about a 25-foot spillway, and you can see that there were boats parked there. There are still boat rentals there, and my son and I, Matt, used to go and rent a boat. This was his birthday weekend in August, we, and it was always when MIS had their race down there. So we would get there, on Saturday, everybody was already at the racetrack. We'd rent the boat and we'd hear the race cars going around the track, you know, for time trials. But it's a very nice, like this dam is owned by the city of Adrian and the five lakes that are formed uh, that back up to this are part of their water system. This is another view of, of the mill. Uh, the dam would be to the, uh, just, just you see where that tr the trees are on the left-hand edge? It's just past there. Take this road around. It goes to a place called Killarney Lutheran Camp. In the summer of 1971, which was the best summer of my life, I was a lifeguard there. I was skinny, I was tanned, and I had long blonde hair. It was a great summer. And I was there all summer. I, uh, it, was, it was just a real unique experience. So I have a lot of, obviously, fond memories of this. Uh, dam and, lake. And, and then it was always nice because it's a sloped uh, spillway so you could uh, slide off the dam and you had a nice little 25 foot water slide down to the lower level. Uh, I was coming here with my friend Victor and we uh, took the back road so I said you're going to see part of this program tonight. This is the old grist mill in Augusta, Michigan. Uh, this would be a view I believe from the river side of it. This is a view from the mill race side. Um, there were, grist mills were a fixture of American life everywhere in America. Uh, wherever there was a, a settlement and farmers that needed grain ground, there was a grist mill. And uh, for the most part, they were water powered. Uh, they would dam a place where the river fell to form um, a mill race, and then there would be this channel that would go into the uh, dam area itself, and there would be a gate there, and that gate's called a sluice gate. And when they would open the sluice gate, that would let the water pour in, it would fall over the paddle wheel, which would turn the grinding mechanisms. You had a top grindstone and a bottom grindstone, and the and the, the flour or the, the, the corn or the uh, wheat would go in there and be ground into flour and then it was sifted out and bagged. Uh, and these, like I say, were very popular wherever settlements came up. So very shortly after there would be a farm settlement, if there was water power nearby, there would be a mill. This is the old Scotts Mill in uh, Scotts, Michigan. Uh, this has been turned into a very nice county park by the Kalamazoo Park System. Um, I posted this particular picture on the um, Vanish Kalamazoo Facebook page and oh, I got all sorts of comments about having weddings there and family reunions. A lot of really nice memories with that and I, they've done a really nice job of preserving that mill. Hit yeah, hit by a birthday. 
How many of you are on Facebook? Okay. Uh, if, you're, if you're not watching, you know, we're, I'm posting a lot of stuff on our Southwest Michigan page and also on the West Michigan postcard page. And then I share with uh, Vanished Kalamazoo or I'll share with um, uh, the Battle Creek group. Uh, you know you grew up from, in Battle Creek when. And I do the same thing in Lansing. On Lansing, I grew up in Lansing Facebook page, and then there's Lansing Historical Society, and it's just generated tons and tons of comments, and I, I, people really appreciate that. So if you go on the Facebook page of our club, you can find links to these other uh, groups, and it's, it's just a really nice uh, way to, to learn some history, and actually I've connected with some old friends, too. This is one of the nicer uh, old mills that I like. It's no longer in existence. It was called the Old Mill and Bridge at uh, Pier Cove. It's also called the Glen Mill. Sometimes it's called the Saugatuck Mill. It's been named any number of towns. But you can see the external water wheel. And there aren't a lot of Michigan uh, mills that have the external water wheel. And it was primarily because of weather. Uh, if you had your water wheel inside, you got a few more months of, of grinding because uh, it came inside. Uh, these things would freeze up as soon as the pond froze. So you were out of business uh, once, once the pond froze. But it was inside, you had running water, and it would, it would, you could uh, heat the inside so the wheel wouldn't fill up. Uh, three kinds of water wheels, uh, the ones that are the most picturesque, and you see them a lot down south of the overshot wheels. This is where you had a very high water uh, level above the mill so that it would come, slope down, and sh overshoot the, uh, the wheel. And the combination of the water and the momentum meant the wheel could turn at a much faster pace. Uh, for the same reason you don't see a lot of external uh, wheels in Michigan, you don't see the overshot. We don't have those type of areas very much, especially in the lower peninsula, that would uh, be amenable to a small trough of water traveling down. Again, it would freeze a lot quicker and then you would lose your source of power. Uh, some of, a lot of them were made out of metal or they were made out of a combination of wood and metal. And if they're, if they're always wet, they, they, they seem to last a lot longer than if they get wet and then they dry out. And why are there two stories? The top floor is filled with grain? They, that's how they, they, the, the flour would go up there and there would be sifting boxes that would sift the grain down to a lower level and that's where they would bag it. I learned this, and we'll talk about it at the end of the program a little bit, but uh, the Frankenmuth mill had a, was actually an operating mill for a while so you could see how they worked and they needed that height to drop everything down. So, This is the mill in Athens again. Uh, you can still see the, the mill race uh, with the dam. Um, as you, uh, if you're going south on M66, the mill race would be on the east side of uh, M66. And uh, they, they went from uh, grist mills where they had grinding stones to these roller mills which used metal blades to chop because as technology improved um, the blades were much more efficient. There was a whole lot less maintenance involved with them than the grist stones and, and it was a lot of work to make grindstones to make these things fit. So, Another roller mill, this is in Constantine. Uh, those of you who've been through there know that there's a big dam in Constantine and this was located right there at the dam. Union City the same way, and you can see it's a four-story building, so they needed to get that, that ground grain up high so they could sift it, get the wheat from the chaff and, and the uh, um, fiber. What do you call the fiber? Bran. Yeah. And you can see there's the mill race, and this again was an internal um, wheel that they used. The, uh, they call it, um, let me check my notes here. There's two other types of wheels. Um, this is pro most of them are probably breast water mills, which meant the water came in and hit the wheel before the center of the wheel. 
so it would it was a short drop instead of going over the top so you didn't have that momentum but a lot of places that didn't have a big drop that mill worked fine that that water wheel worked just fine because it it was uh, amenable first of all it wasn't that big like the overshot so they could go inside a building but you could also make it wider so it made what it lacked in height it made up in width and so all that water coming over was enough to power the mill and the last one was called an undershot mill and that's actually where the water wheel sat in the water and the water rushing through the race would push it as it went through the race so it would spin and obviously that probably had the least amount of power but it, it still provided power where, there, where it was needed. Uh, got a lot of comments from this when I posted this on the Battle Creek Facebook page. Uh, the old Verona, it says the Kalamazoo River. It's not the Kalamazoo River, it's the Battle Creek River. And I had people argue with me, and finally <laughs> a lot of people in Battle Creek came to my defense and said, yeah, it's a misprint. And I mentioned that right in the listing. I said it says the Kalamazoo, but it's the Battle Creek. And you can see in the background, um, there's a bridge right behind there. So the mill race kind of went in, went around, and then came down through. You can see where the water's coming out of the bottom of the mill there. The dam's still there, yeah. Uh, this is the old mill in Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence is near and dear to my heart because my dad grew up there. In fact, if you went straight up that road till it ended and then turned right, about a quarter mile, that's where my dad's farm was. So. Uh, this mill was not there when I was a kid. Uh, it was probably torn down a long time ago. Looks like it was already in disrepair in 1907. Um, and we'll get to that. We're kind of transitioning here in just a minute. Uh, Mike and I were talking about this beforehand. There's, there's two grist mills in Leonidas. You said this one is at the dam? Because there's one, there's, there's still a mill there. Yeah, there's still a mill there. I think this is a Nile, and it's uh, east north out of, out of the dam. And the dam is, I don't see the dam. It's probably behind the bridge, yeah. actually. This is the other mill. Looks like a big hip barn. But they're both Mark Leonidas, and, and as you know, there's not much to Leonidas yeah, today. I thought it was a private residence. It kind of is, but then there's a park all around it. Oh, okay. So you can go down there, and a lot of people go down there and photograph. It's really a sleeper. I'll have to go down there sometime. Yeah. Don't know too much about this. This is a really nice picture of a, a, a larger dam. Pittsford is over in the Metro Detroit area, and uh, this is a nice shot of the, uh, the dam. <coughs> Surprise, Floyd's not here. This is a grist mill in Sumner in southwest Michigan. Uh, as you can see, this is not a very big building and it doesn't look like there's much of a drop in water, so it was probably one of those um, undershot wheels where the water just flowed through and, and slowly moved the wheel. Mill in Bellevue. Again, this is a roller mill, so they've, they've converted to steel. This was abandoned for quite a long time. I actually went in there and took pictures back in the 70s when I was first a budding photographer. Uh, and now they've uh, redone it. It's a private residence apparently. But it's a beautiful location. Really nice mill race there. It's the old mill in Okemos. Uh, I just posted this on Facebook and there's some debate whether this is still there. I've never seen it. Uh, and I don't remember anybody ever talking about it. I, in fact, I, f I found this card and I was just surprised there was a mill in Oakland. It was probably along the Red Cedar River. Uh, it doesn't move very fast there, so it was probably one of those undershot wheels again where the water simply flowed through. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is the Mason Milling Company. Where this sits right now, the, um, the creek is, is probably 20 feet below there. So. My guess is that this was probably, if you look at it, it's got a big smokestack. And this was, this was one of the C.R. Childs cards from about 1910 to 1920. 
to see electrification and as electricity became available or steam power the mills converted from a water wheel to that because it was more powerful it was cheaper and there was a whole lot less maintenance so you're going to start to see more of these uh, mills uh, needed to be close to a water source because if it was running on steam it would need water for the steam power but there may have been a wheel down on the creek, they may have dammed it, and then there may have been some way to connect that wheel up to the mill. But that, today this building still stands, it's a, a business has converted it, and it looks very nice, and I didn't get a chance to get down there and get a picture of it, but it's one of the mills that's still standing. Another one that's still standing is the Olivet Mills. Um, this Olivet's just uh, southwest of Lansing and uh, near Charlotte. One of the, uh, you can see again, uh, the big smokestacks in the back, so they were starting to convert their, their machinery to steam power or to electricity. Same thing with the Sunfield. If, if you know anything about Sunfield, there's, there's <laughs> it's pretty flat and there's not a lot of water rowing through there, so I'm pretty sure this was probably built as a uh, steam-powered mill. The old flour mill at Smyrna, this is right near where White's Bridge used to be. Smyrna is just a very small settlement, just uh, probably two or three miles north of where the White's Bridge crossing used to be. Again, this is, this is a later card, prob probably from the 20s by, by the looks of the car. Goblesville Milling Company, what can you tell us about that, Dick? Okay. So it was either, elect it would probably was, again, you can see a smokestack in the background. And a lot of times you'll see wood, wood piles associated with that. So that's probably was their source for grinding. And this is another one of those CR Childs postcards. This is interesting. This is a, a electric plant and flour mills at Saranac. So the, it was probably a combination of a generating station and a water-powered grist mill. There's, there's uh, a pretty substantial dam on the Grand River in uh, Saranac. But again, you can see the electrical wires coming in. Didn't take very long before um, a lot of these small mills were put out of business by larger milling operations once they could electrify and uh, once um, travel improved so the farmers could get their grain to a central location these larger mills could, could grind for a whole lot less than these small operators. And generally, once the, the owner of the mill died out, so did the mill because it was a tough life. You know, it's it kind of like a lighthouse keeper. You had to be there all the time. So, and it was seasonal. You know, when winter came, everything froze over. So uh, there was not a lot of milling to be done. This mill still stands in Frankenmuth, not quite like it is. Uh, especially the right side of the mill has all been redone. But, uh, of course, Franklin was a very historic town. And uh, this one has been repurposed rather nicely. Uh, this Nichols Humminger was the historic owners of it, and they got permission to use that when, as they repurposed the mill. And this is the one I was telling you about. This, is, this operation is no longer going. They've turned it into, I think, a microbrewery now. But uh, for a long time, you could go in there and actually watch them grind grain. You could walk up to the third floor and see where they dumped in the grain and where it all got shook out and where it got ground and where it got bagged. It was really quite a nice operation. They, they still do that? Okay. Great. And the last thing, um, I, I talk about historic covered bridges and Bridges like the Ackley Bridge in Greenfield Village don't really count because that was one that Henry Ford basically stole from some place and brought it to his Greenfield Village Museum, so it's not a native one. This particular bridge was built in Michigan in 1979. In fact, I was there when they were dragging the, the bridge across the river. There's no steel nails, bolts, or anything. This is all put together with wood pegs and wedges. And what they had was a team of oxen on the uh, west side or the south side of the bridge there. And those oxen were hooked up to massive block and tackles. And this was in the winter, so the, they had built the covered bridge 
over by where the, uh, the uh, Frankenmuth uh, Zenders Bavarian Inn Lodge is. And these oxen would go about 50 yards and the bridge would move four inches. Okay, four oxen moved that whole bridge across because of the block and tackle. So they unhooked the oxen, bring them back to the start, hook them up again, pull 50 yards and pull that bridge four inches. It took them all winter to get it across, but it was built exactly like they used to do a lot of covered bridges where uh, it was too long. And it's a beautiful covered bridge. It's in Frankenmuth. Uh, where, where you're at is your, this is the Cass River and you're standing on the bridge over the Cass River. There used to be a big brewery, a Carling Brewery there as you came into town and the Carling Brewery would be on the right but that's all been torn down and now it's a, a little village full of gift shops. But uh, this is the last bridge that I have on my talk. Are there any questions? Roller mills. Yes. So They were steel rollers. The two rollers would be together and the grain would come between them and they were spring loaded so that, so, so that they could separate enough for the grain to go through. And it was not just one roller, it ran through several rollers to grind the grain down to the side. But they were still grinding it, they weren't rolling it like, like rolled oats. Or... Well it was, in, instead, of, instead of the, 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 the base grindstone being there and then uh, uh, the top grindstone coming down and being circular this was a this kind of a thing so um, apparently it was more efficient I don't know all about the physics of it but it became a very popular way to go because like I said grindstones were hard to come by they made them up in grindstone city way up at the tip of the thumb and then they had to transport them down here so if there was a crack in the grindstone they'd have to order a new one with the steel ones they were mass produced and they could order whatever size they wanted. So, a lot of information on the. Uh, right, well, yeah. There's, there's an old miller, an old miller right there. Was that on the Crystal River? Okay, so that probably would have been one of those undershot ones because there's really not a drop there. But, but I, I know the river at times does run fairly quick, so if, we, if it was running enough to push a mill yeah. wheel, it, they would, that's what they had to use, so they used it. And like I say, once, once uh, larger companies came in, like Knapp and Milling in, in uh, Augusta or uh, Star of the West in Frankenmuth, a lot of these large operations, uh, the small guy just couldn't compete. And uh, with transportation and, and electrification, these all just became obsolete. So they, a lot of them either were converted to private residences, if they could be, or they were just let go and, and became the victim of, of time or arson or uh, you know, just the elements. But I was just gonna say, there's a lot of information on the internet about existing mills and almost nothing about the historic mills that are no longer there. Same thing with the covered bridges. I found lots about the, the existing covered bridges, but the ones that are like the Middleville and, and the one in Deerfield, there's absolutely nothing. You'd almost have to go to a local history group and, to get that kind of information. Anything else? I was just gonna say that there were two big mills in Grand Rapids. There was, there was a Canal on both sides of the river, on the east and the west side. Of the have you ever seen any pictures of the mills there? Oh uh, yeah, I have. And not real photos though. Boyd. 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 Right, that's right. I remember. I remember seeing postcards. I can't remember. It was on uh, something. On the west side, the one on the east side. Yeah, the one on the east side was right there by Bridge Street. Lily White Flower. Yeah. They were and see, they were probably big enough enterprises that they, when, when they were able to, they converted to, to electricity or to steam so that they could uh, get bigger and, and larger. And that's what happened with Napa over in Athens, or uh, Augusta. Um, just as a, a sidebar, the, 
the Voidin House in Grand Rapids, which is part of the public museum. It's a, it's a house that's separate from the museum. Okay. But, um, that belonged to the Voigt Milling family, and they were a, an unusual family. They built this house in the 1890s, and they basically never changed anything in this house. Hmm. And then in the 60s, the last son died, and um, eventually the museum bought this house, but it was just like this time capsule. Mm -hmm. It yeah. had a uh, wood stove in it. And it's, uh, no hangers. No hangers. Which that, that huh. It, it, was, it was built before they invented the hangers, so there's just, you know, drawers to pull things up. Okay. Hooks to hang things up. Mm -hmm. so foundation for hangers. Okay, any other questions? Thank you very much.